Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good evening, everyone. So we are here tonight to talk about the proposed air permit for General Motors Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant. So my name is Jennifer Dixon, and I'm going to be moderating tonight. Before we get into the logistics of the meeting, though, I want to introduce Marianne Dolahanty, and she is our Air Quality Division Director. She's a decision maker on the proposed permit, and she's going to be listening closely to all the questions and comments tonight from all of you. So I wanted to give Marianne an opportunity to say a few words before we start the actual meeting. So Marianne, would you like to say um, some things before we get started? Sure. Thanks, Jen. I really appreciate it. So. Um, I'd like to uh, personally thank you all for you know, taking the time out of your evening to participate on this call and um, in this hearing. Uh, we know that nothing is, is normal right now, and this crisis has affected people in a variety of different ways. This, is, this isn't the way we would typically conduct our public participation process, um, and we understand it's not perfect. Uh, so thank you again for joining us, and I'd invite you to contact staff, reach out to staff even after tonight. If you have further questions, um, we'll provide, make sure that we provide that information so that you have contact information for everyone. You know, please let us know what your comments are and your concerns, um, not only about this proposed permit um, that we're here to talk about tonight, but the whole public participation process in general. And again, you know, we, we understand that this is, this is unique and not perfect. Um, we're, we're looking at a lot of different ways to connect with folks and, and be able to take comment. Um, this is one of them that we have, we're, we're trying out and wanting to improve um, and maybe keeping this one as sort of a, um, an option in our toolbox going forward. So appreciate um, you coming on tonight. And at this point, I'm gonna pass it back to Jennifer um, and she can get the rest of the night started. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Marianne. I appreciate you being here tonight. And I kind of conned her into saying, the, you know, something tonight, usually at the hearings, we don't necessarily do that, but you also usually get to see her. So um, I wanted to let you guys know that she's actually here, she's listening, and she's very, you know, involved in this process. So I can think you can, hopefully, if I can get my stuff together here. There we go. All right. So I have a little bit of an agenda for you. I wanted to just show that up on the screen. And, and I know that we probably have some people that have only called into the meeting tonight. So if you were not at the informational session um, on the 23rd, you might not have heard kind of our uh, my little spiel that I've been giving about the fact that this platform that we're using, if people only are able to call in, they're not able to be unmuted or speak, and we don't really know that you're on, but I want to make sure that we're addressing that just in case we have people listening. I'm assuming that we do. So right now what I'm showing on the screen is the agenda for the evening, and um, the first thing I want to do is introduce the Air Quality Division staff that I have here with me tonight. So you're going to primarily hear from Dave Thompson. He is the permit engineer on the project, but I also have Jeff Korniski and Bob Burns, and they have um, work in our field offices and they have a field inspector's perspective on this facility and the issues surrounding it. Um, I have Susan Kilmer from our air monitoring unit. I have Jim Haywood from our air modeling unit. And I have Mike Deppa. He's one of our toxicologists that worked on the project. And I also have Trace McDonald with us tonight. And he wasn't with us at the last informational meeting, but he works in our state implementation plan unit. And he'll be um, available to answer some questions on non-attainment, if there's any, and, and things like that. So the way the evening is going to work is we're going to start off with an informational session again. And I'm going to have Dave Thompson present some information on the issue. So if you were here during the last informational session, it's going to be very similar. I will say that we had some things that we learned from that meeting that we have added some more information into the presentation and, and hopefully some more details that are going to help people understand what the company is actually proposing. So after that little presentation, we're going to have a question and answer session. So that question and answer session is going to be the opportunity for people who are um, participating via the webinar to be able to ask questions. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how to ask those questions in a couple minutes. I'm also want to really go over ways that you can submit an official comment. So if you're not on the webinar right now, 
and you're only listening in on the phone, we have a variety of different ways that you can submit a comment. Uh, your comments are really, really important to us, like Marianne said, and we want to make sure we give you a lot of different ways to get those to us if you want to. Um, once the question and answer session is over, or at 7 o'clock, whichever comes first, we're going to start the official hearing. So during the hearing, and you'll hear me say this a couple times, um, we are not able to respond to your, your comments or questions. That is your opportunity to tell us what you think about the proposed project, make comments or suggestions on things, but we won't be responding. So it's going to be a little bit different than a live hearing, but we'll work our way through that and I'll give you some more details on that later. After the official hearing is over, we're going to just go over again where you can find more information on this proposed project. You don't have to give a comment tonight. The comment period doesn't end until May 29th. So you have quite a ways after this hearing to be able to still submit comments if you don't want to this evening. I'm also gonna give you some very detailed information about who you can contact if you have further questions. So going forward, just as a reminder, your lines are gonna all be muted whether you're calling in or you're on the webinar. You can submit your questions using the question box. And so that would be if you wanted to just type in a question. You don't have to speak your question out loud. Typing in a question is completely acceptable. And I'll tell you a little bit more how to do that, giving you a lot of details tonight. Also, we're recording this webinar. We had recorded the informational session and that's available for viewing if you're interested later. Um, and we also will be recording this one and we will make sure it's closed captioned as well when it is posted online. All right, so how the meeting is gonna work today. If you have a question, you can type the word question in the question box. And the reason we're being a little bit specific about this is that we can either take a question or a comment tonight at any time. So if you have a question, you're gonna just type the word question and type your question. And I'll read your question aloud and have staff answer it. If you just wanna make a comment either now or during the comment period, when we start the official hearing, just type the word comment and then type in your comment. I will read your comment aloud unless you indicate you do not want me to. So during any time, either tonight or later before the end of the comment period, you can send your comments in by email if you have access to email, or you can call your comment into our voicemail box and that number is 517-284-0900. And I'll give that to you again at the end of the meeting. And I, I forgot that I had wanted to mention for people that might only be listening on the phone, if you wanted to grab a piece of paper and, and jot some things down, that might be helpful because I'll be giving out some email addresses and potentially some phone numbers that you might want later. All right, so here's the nitty gritty on how to ask a question in GoToWebinar because it's a little bit confusing sometimes. What you want to do is you want to find that little question box at the bottom. If you look to the first one here, it says your hand is down, but it has a green arrow pointing up. And I will admit that during the last um, informational session, I said these backwards, so I apologize for that. But if the green arrow is pointing up, it means your hand is down and you have an opportunity to raise your hand. If you have the little red arrow pointing down, that means your hand is already up. So if you want to ask a question out loud, you would just click on that raise your hand button, your hand would be raised. And then once we get done with the presentation portion, I will try to unmute you. And so as long as your microphone is working, you should be able to ask your question verbally. Again, there's no pressure. You do not have to do that. More than welcome to type the question in the question box. So if for some reason we're going through the evening tonight and you have further questions that you want to ask staff, I just wanna invite you, if you have access to the internet, you can email any of your questions to, directly to our permit engineer, Dave Thompson. And his email address is, and I will give it to you again at the end too, just in case you aren't quite ready to write it down, but I'll, I'll go slowly in case you are. It's um, thompsond22 at michigan.gov. So it's T as in Tom, H as in help, O is in octopus, M is in Mary, P is in Paul, S is in Sam, O is in octopus, N is in Nancy, D is in David, the number 22, and it's at Michigan, all spelled out, dot gov as in government. You can also call Dave directly. He has his voicemail set up right now because we are working from home, but he does check his voicemail daily. His phone number is 517 
284-6787. And again, I will share this information with you at the end of the um, evening tonight in case you need it. You can always feel free to call Dave, ask, um, send him an email, or even if, you know, whoever you have in air quality, just talk, tell him you trying to reach someone about the GM um, proposed project, and they'll be happy to direct you in the right direction. So Dave, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you. All right, thank you, Jen. Um, good evening, everyone. As Jen said, my name is Dave Thompson. I am the lead permit engineer for the application for the proposed automotive assembly line at General Motors Detroit Hamtramck Assembly Plant. And I am one of multiple AQD staff that were involved, excuse me, were involved in the review. Um, we're gonna start with an overview of the air quality division and then talk a little bit about the proposed project. Now we all know that pollution comes from many different things, such as big farms, fuel burning vehicles, and various industrial sources. The overall mission of the air quality division is to protect public health and the environment. And the air quality division has the authority to do this by regulating industrial sources. The AQD, um, is separated into different functions. Uh, for example, some air quality staff monitor levels of air pollutants. Other staff look at different toxics to make sure that public health is protected. Uh, the AQD conducts inspections of regulated facilities and we review applications and write permits for sources of air pollutants to ensure that operations comply with our rules and regulations. As I said, the Air Quality Division has the authority to permit sources of air pollutants. However, I do want to point out a few things that the permit does not cover and that the AQD does not have the ability to regulate. You will want to talk to your local government if you have questions or concerns about issues such as zoning, noise, and traffic. Next, I'd like to give a simplified overview of the steps the applicant and the air quality division go through to get a proposed draft permit out for comment. Um, first, the applicant plans the project, of course. Uh, next, the applicant submits a permit application to the AQD. The application is then reviewed by an engineer. And once the permit is peer reviewed and approved by a supervisor, the proposed draft permit is sent to the company for review and then posted for public comment. Comments received during the public comment period are evaluated and can potentially lead to changes in the proposed permit. And finally, a decision is made on the permits. And that decision can be either approved, approved with changes or denied. So what is GM requesting? GM is proposing to install a new automotive assembly line at the Detroit Hantramic assembly plant. The main portions of the existing assembly line would be removed to provide space for the new line. And the main portions of an automotive assembly line are a body shop for putting together the unpainted vehicle, a paint shop where various paints and other materials are applied, and the assembly area where final operations such as glass, engine, and tire installation are performed. Now, while reviewing a proposed project, the Air Quality Division looks at a number of items. We review the level of emissions to figure out how the project and the facility should be classified. Based upon the level of emissions and the type of equipment, we determine what type of review is needed, including which rules and regulations the proposed project is subject to. One part of figuring out the applicable rules for a project is is the location of the facility. Now this map shows the current attainment status for the state of Michigan. And an area is considered to be in non-attainment if air concentrations of certain pollutants are above the national standards. Now Michigan currently has non-attainment areas for two pollutants, ozone and sulfur dioxide, which is also known as SO2. Now, the Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant is located in an area that is considered in non-attainment for ozone. And ozone is regulated through two other pollutants, which are volatile organic compounds, which are also known as VOCs, 
and oxides of nitrogen, which is also known as NOx. If the overall increase in emissions from a project for these pollutants is high enough, then that pollutant needs to go through what is called a non-attainment permit review. Also, if the increase in overall emissions for certain other pollutants is high enough, then those pollutants need to go through what is called a prevention of significant deterioration, which is a mouthful, or a PSD permit review. The application addresses these pollutants through a netting analysis for both non-attainment and prevention of significant deterioration, as well as how the project would meet applicable state and federal regulations. Now, a netting analysis uses the facility's past emissions, certain increases and decreases in emissions allowed from the facility, and the proposed emissions from the new assembly line to get a net change for each pollutant. If the net change for any single pollutant is more than a certain amount, then that pollutant must go through a more stringent review, which I had mentioned before, they're a non-attainment or PSD permit review. The netting analysis performed for this project shows that the net change in emissions for all individual pollutants is less than its specified amount. Therefore, no pollutant is required to go through a non-attainment or PSD permit review. I would like to point out that although the proposed project is not subject to these particular types of review, it must still comply with all other applicable rules and regulations. And throughout the review process and during development of the proposed draft permit, the AQD has ensured that the applicable state and federal rules have been met. For example, the proposed project must show that it would comply with State of Michigan Rule 702 for volatile organic compounds. This part of the review is based on a what is called a best available control technology or BACT analysis. Now the BACT review results in one of the most well-controlled automotive assembly lines in the nation. A group of thermal oxidizers would be used to control the exhaust from the main coating portions of the paint shop, lowering the amount of volatile organic compound emissions to the atmosphere. And this is a generic diagram of the equipment that would be controlled by what are called regenerative thermal oxidizers. Historically, the equipment being controlled was the prime and top coat ovens. In the proposed assembly line, not only would the ovens be controlled, but all of these other areas as well. There would be five oxidizers used to control VOC emissions. GM has proposed using five smaller oxidizers instead of one large one because of how the paint shop is designed. One process in the paint shop is called a top coat operation where a color base coat and a protective clear coat are applied to the vehicle. And you can see it's the five near identical um, rectangular shapes there. Now the proposed assembly line would have six smaller top coat processes and the number of oxidizers running to control emissions would depend on how many top coat processes are being used. In addition to meeting Rule 702, the application shows that compounds emitted from the project would meet their health-based screening levels. Also, computer simulations, which is often referred to as modeling, have been performed for oxides of nitrogen, or NOx, and then two different sizes of particulate matter, which are known as PM10 and PM2.5, to show that no violation of any national standards is expected. Uh, the assembly line would also be required to place particulate filter systems on all spray coating processes to lower the amount of dust and paint particles that exit the plant. If the permit is issued, GM would have to comply with all final conditions that have incorporated the review of these state and federal regulations. GM has also proposed an initial low production period after the assembly line starts making vehicles. During this period, the assembly line would have a lower volatile organic compound emission limit and would only be allowed to make a maximum of 10,000 vehicles per year. All control equipment used for lowering emissions during normal production would also be required to run during the low production period. And after the low initial low production period ends, the volatile organic compound emission limits for normal production would then go into effect. And based on the review performed, the proposed permit contains emission limits for the pollutants listed here, as well as a limit on natural gas usage. The proposed permit also contains testing 
monitoring and record keeping requirements that would be used to show that the assembly line meets these limits. If the permit is approved, the emission limits in combination with the testing, monitoring, and record keeping requirements ensure that the Detroit and Amtramic assembly line would comply with the rules and regulations. I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, please give me a minute and we'll continue with our question and answer portion. Hey, yeah. actually, Dave, it's Jennifer. So I remember that we have people on the phone. And so when we say the permit limits listed here, do you think you could just read off the different pollutants that have limits contained in the permit? So just if we have people that are just listening, they can kind of get an um, image of what we're talking about here. Absolutely. Um, we have limits for volatile organic compounds, uh, particulate matter, uh, also known as PM. There's a particulate matter less than 10 microns in diameter, which is known as PM10. Particulate matter less than 2.5 microns in diameter, which is PM2.5. Oxid, oxides of nitrogen, which is NOx. Sulfur dioxide, which is SO2. Carbon monoxide, uh, and also known as, or also shortened to CO, and then also greenhouse gases. Or and GHG. then you had already mentioned, yeah, you had and mentioned natural, that. And there's, natural, there's a natural gas usage limit as well. Right, perfect, okay, thank you. I just wanna make sure that anyone listening on the phone also sort of has that big, bigger picture of, of what we're talking about here. So we are gonna move to the question and answer section. Um, there is one question so far, so that's good. We like questions, we want you guys to ask questions. So again, if you have a question, you can type it into the question box. Um, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, you can do that as well. I'm happy to unmute you. And as long as your microphone is working, we should be totally fine to um, have you speak your question out loud. Um, and hopefully you guys can remember what that means asking the question. Remember if it's the green arrow pointing up, it means you have the opportunity to raise your hand. And if it's the red arrow pointing down, it means your hand's already up. So if you don't want your hand up, because I said it backwards last time, a bunch of people raised their hand and I was like, do you really want to ask a question? They're like, no, no. So just to kind of clarify that. Um, so just to go over again, who is going to be on our panel today? So you've heard from myself and I'm going to be moderating our question and answer. And you've heard from Dave, he's our permit section engineer. So uh, just as a reminder, I have Jeff Korniski, he's out of our Detroit district office. And then Bob Burns is out of our Lansing district office, but he specializes in automotive assembly plants. So he often helps us out when we're working through new permits like this or inspecting these larger assembly plants. Jim Haywood is part of our modeling unit. So he works with our air modelers, which are the people who look at the proposed emissions that the facility has requested and says, you know, how are these going to be affecting the community? And we can talk a little bit more about that later if anyone's interested. And um, we have Mike Deppa from our toxics unit. So he helped with the toxics review for this permit application. Um, we also have Susan Kilmer from our air monitoring unit. So air monitoring, they're the ones that have the physical um, like machines that go, that are located at certain specific stationary places and they pull in outdoor air and sample it for pollutants. And a lot of those are kind of real time numbers that you can get on the web if you're interested in that, or some of them actually go to a lab to be tested. So she can definitely answer questions about that. I've got Trace McDonald on as well, and he can answer questions about some non-attainment stuff if anyone's interested in um, ozone and, and things like that. So we've got like a great group of people to answer questions. So I really appreciate everybody being on. Um, last time we had a lot of great questions too, so that was really nice. Um, so one of our first questions, Dave, is gonna go to you. Um, and that question, it's interesting because I, I, see, I see what the person's getting at here. And the question is, what does it mean when Eagle quote, writes a permit. So if you can kind of talk a little bit about, you know, we talked about the process, we talked about the rules that we want to make sure the proposed project meets, but what does it mean for you to take all this information that the people from the panel have collected and made and helped you review and actually put it in a proposed permit, a bunch of conditions and a piece of paper? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, basically the a permit is a, as you said, is a is a collection of conditions and requirements that are needed um, 
on a specific piece of equipment. I mean, just to talk about it, you know, from a more general standpoint. Um, for example, there the, the they have to meet certain, as I said earlier, they have to meet certain um, health-based screening levels, um, and to meet for you know for specific compounds uh and in order to meet those from you know sometimes larger facilities you have to put on control equipment which is what the oxidizers are for now we still review all the emissions from there but in order to you know make sure that those compounds are are still meeting their you know are are being properly controlled there are requirements in the permit to operate the oxidizer properly um you know you have to keep the correct temperature and it has to be designed correctly it has to be able to take the flow and, and and there's a number of different other things but it's it's a variety of it's basically things that have to occur in these pieces of equipment in order to comply with the rules and regulations and that's it's it's called federally enforceable conditions so um so all the conditions you write, for instance, it's not like everything is just sitting in there solitary by itself. If you have an emission limit for one of the things in the list that you gave us, like VOCs, there's other parts of the permit that require the company to do certain things to show that they're actually meeting that limit. And so you might have some monitoring requirements saying you have to monitor the temperature and certain things, or like Dave said, how often you're using it or at what point is it being um, operated? How many hours is it being operated? Things like that. So everything in the permit kind of ties together. So when we write this, these bunch of conditions, the intent of, is it, of all of them together is to ensure that we are, we have enough oversight of the proposed emissions to make sure that the facility is in compliance. So um, I hope that answers the question. And I think it does. Um, definitely, if you have a clarifying question or further questions, give me um, give me a little bit more um, detail on that for sure and that would be amazing. So we have a couple more questions coming in. Like I said, we have plenty of time tonight so we aren't gonna start the hearing until seven or until you guys get done asking questions, I guess whatever comes first there. But um, one of the questions that we had um, was having to do with those greenhouse gases that we had talked about before. So I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about what the greenhouse gases are that we're looking at and how we would be monitoring for those? And Dave, I'm sorry, I meant to pass that question to you, so I apologize for that. Uh, no, that's fine, Jen, I, uh, I had to unmute myself. So, um, well, the greenhouse gases, are mainly produced from combustion uh, or you know basically burning of natural gas which is is needed for for example the control equipment the oxidizers they burn natural gas in order to control the volatile organic compounds um and it's mainly co2 methane and uh, um there's a there's a it's called nitrous oxide which is n2o which are the main chemicals but um so basically we examine GHG generation and air quality impacts differently than other pollutants because it takes a lot more greenhouse gases to impact air quality. Um, for example, pollutants like nitrous oxide and volatile organic compounds trigger significance, what we call significance at about 40 tons per year or at 40 tons per year while greenhouse gases trigger at approximately 75,000 tons per year. Um, and that means that, you know, basically they've looked at it and it, it means that the lower amounts of nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds can impact public health and the environment at lower levels than greenhouse gases. So we regulate greenhouse gases, gases differently and at different levels than other pollutants. And one comparison, as you can consider, is if you have one marble in your hand that presents one ton of VOCs. In the other hand, to get, you know, a significant a emissions of significance, you'd have to have almost just under 1,900 marbles in order to represent a similar level of review required for air permitting. 
And okay. Sorry, go ahead, Jen. No, I was just going to say, okay, I thought, I mean, I, I like your analogy there. I, I, I can picture that for sure. They're definitely looked at differently, right? All right, so I have another question here, and this question would be for Jeff Korniski. Jeff, the question is referring to the compliance history that GM has had at this location. Has there any, been any violations or anything like that um, that you could kind of go over, give us a brief overview of their compliance history? Sure. So under the previous configuration of the plant, um, GM was issued a violation notice in 2009 and in 2013. Those are the two most recent violation notices. The first one in 2009 was for irregularities in the water wash system in terms of record keeping. That's the, the system that um, knocks down the particulate emissions within the spray booths. And in 2013, they had some issues with um, their, you know, we have regenerative thermal oxidizers in this proposed process. In the previous configuration of the plant, they had just general thermal oxidizers. And they have to, there was one for each of the coating lines. And in one of the lines, uh, the uh, electrical sequencing was, uh, was not, uh, after it had been shut down and hadn't been reconfigured. And so they had violations of their temperature requirements for that one um, top coat oven. So two violations in essence over the last 10 years, and we haven't issued a violation notice uh, since 2013 to my recollection. Doesn't mean that there's never been any issues with the, with the plant since 2013 with these large facilities. Um, it's almost, uh, it's, it's commonplace to have what I'll call minor deviations, maybe a missed record uh, here or there. Uh, they weren't enough to warrant a violation notice. Um, but there'll be, there'll be deviations really with almost any auto assembly plant or steel mill or refinery. Uh, but we have issued violation notices for what we consider to be, uh, you know, major violations of a rule or regulation or a permit. And uh, for a GM ham traffic, there were two in the last 10 years. Okay, thank you. So just to let everyone know, we have one more question that is in the queue. So if you have other questions, feel free to type them in there now. Um, so this question, Dave, is not to you, but if you could help me out by pulling up the um, information about the modeling, because I'm going to pass this question over to Jim, and I want to be able to show that modeling diagram. Sure. So let me, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and give you um, control of that. So if you can pull that up. And then Jim, if you can just talk a little bit about how the modeling was done for this facility and what exactly we're looking at here as far as how does a modeling, how does a, how do you even do modeling or what are you looking at and what am I looking at by looking at this um, picture? And remember, we've got people on the phone, so if you can be descriptive, I'd appreciate it. Okay, let's see if I can paint a picture in everybody's head. So let me back up a little bit and just describe why we do air quality modeling. And the concept of that is, is that we as a regulatory agency cannot issue a permit unless we're convinced that this project will not cause or contribute to any air quality violations. Now, if you wanna know what the quality of air is, normally you can go out and you can stick a monitor up and you can actually measure the air and know whether or not uh, that the air is safe to breathe. You can't really do that before the project is built. So what we have to do is kind of forecast what the air quality will be, uh, knowing what the maximum potential emissions will be from this project. So what we do is we take those potential emissions and we put them inside of a computer model that is provided to us by EPA. And basically what it is, it's a computer simulation of how air pollutants move around in the air. And once it moves around in the air, then it will dilute and disperse as it blows downwind. So what we do in the picture, if you can see it for those people who are on a computer and I'll try to describe it to the people who are on the phone, think of it as a map that has a lot of dots on it. And each one of those dots, we kind of refer to as a virtual monitor. So in other words, it's kind of a future monitor. If we put in what the emissions will be into the computer model, it will calculate what an impact will be or what the air concentration will be at each one of those little dots out there. And we try to make it dense enough 
that literally almost everybody has one of those dots in their backyard. What we do is we take that and we run our computer simulation and we look at all of the impacts at all those little dots on the map and we pick out the one, the only one that is the maximum impact for all that entire map. That impact has to be less than what the air quality standard will be. If it's not, then we have to go back to the applicant and say the model predicts that you're going to violate a standard. You have to do something to get that number lower. And so until that happens, we cannot issue the permit. So we will work with these people and eventually we will get that number to be below any air quality standard. Uh, and at that point, then my job is pretty much done. And I give those numbers back to the permit engineer. I give those numbers back to the toxicologist and say the modeling is done and it shows that it's not going to cause or contribute to any kind of air quality violation. I like that. You did a good job of painting that picture. I could, I can see it, but I could also visualize it. So I greatly appreciate that. Hopefully, you know, if people on the phone have questions about some of the things that we've been talking about today and you really aren't understanding or being able to visualize what exactly we're talking about, we definitely have ways that we can get you, you know, a paper copy of the slides from tonight. We'll be sharing those, you know, on the web as well. If you do have internet access and you just weren't able to get on line tonight but we definitely do have ways that we can get you that information so i'm going to grab that back from you dave and you should be good to go there so again that was our last question i you know i have all, a lot of people here for you so you know sh just definitely ask anything you're thinking about even if it's unrelated to gm we're happy to take those questions as well um, I want to make sure we give plenty of time for you to ask a question, knowing obviously that you have other opportunities after this hearing to ask questions as well. Um, but seeing that we're not getting any questions in the box and I didn't have anyone raising your hand and, and again, that's fine. Um, so we're talking a little bit about um, how else you can submit an official comment. So just to remind you, there's plenty of other ways you don't necessarily have to speak aloud at this hearing tonight. You don't have to necessarily write your comment in the chat box. You can send your comment by mail. Um, I'm not gonna read out the whole address to you, but if you're interested in submitting a comment by mail, please feel free to give a call to Dave Thompson again, and I'll give you his number again in a little bit. Um, and he will be more than happy to get you that address so that you can send that in. You can also send it in by email, and that email address is eagle, so it's E as in eagle, G as in go, L as in love, E as in eagle, and then it's dash AQD, so A as in apple, Q as in queen, D as in Dave, then dash PTI, so P as in Paul, T as in Tom, I as in igloo, the word public comments all spelled out. So it's eagle dash AQD dash PTI public comments at michigan.gov. Or you can always call our public comment voicemail box at 517-284-0900. So that's a lot of different options for you if you're interested in providing a comment after the public hearing tonight. Again, if you want to provide a comment tonight, you want to just type the word comment in the question box. You're going to then you can either type your comment and I'll read it out loud. And if you unless you indicate don't read Jennifer, <laughs> please don't read this out loud. I'll definitely read that out loud for you. Um, you can also participate by raising your hand if you're on the webinar today and we'll try to unmute your line so that you can speak out loud. So one of the, we just got another question and this question is um, how is the air monitored on site? So how would GM be expected to calculate their emissions or ensure the, they're meeting those emission limits? So Dave, before we go on to the public comment period, let's just make sure that we answer people's questions if we can. So can you talk a little bit about how the monitoring and record keeping um, have would ensure that the company is complying with the actual emission limits in the proposed permit? Um, sure. Uh, basically, the uh, facility will be required to keep track of everything that they or all the coatings, sealers, all the materials that they use for you know, putting the automobile together to assembling the automobile, they would have to keep track of all of these things. 
um, how much paint they use, how much sealer they use, you know, these, these, you know, there's a multiple multitude of, of issues there. And there's also, um, you know, they would have to keep track of that on a specific time period to say, okay, we use this much paint, this paint has much this many volatile organic compounds. So this is how much went to the control, to the control uh, equipment, the, the oxidizers. And there's, you know, it's a complicated calculation to do that. Um, and then they also are going to be, they're also required to do a, you know, a certain amount of, of stack testing. Um, so they, they go in and they verify that their oxidizers are operating correctly, or operating properly, I should say. They do testing to show that, okay, the oxidizer is truly controlling and burning up, you know, the required amount of VOCs in order to, or volatile organic compounds in order to, you know, meet that emission rate. And then they, they do that for a, multi a multitude of different, uh, they're, they're going to be, have to do that for, you know, a, a different uh, pollutants. Um, and I don't know if Jeff Korniski or, or Bob, I guess, would you have any more additional comments about this one? Yeah, I was going to say, Dave, I think that's a great tie-in. If if we can have Jeff talk a little bit about, um, or actually Bob might be better because he's done a lot of inspections of these types of facilities, to talk a little bit about what does the inspector do then once it once a permit is issued. So if this proposed permit is issued to the facility, they build all of the equipment with the assembly line. Um, how does the inspector then go into the facility and ensure that all the conditions in the permit are being met? So Bob, do you, if you don't mind talking about that a little bit through your experience, we'll give Jeff a little bit of a break there. Sure, Jen. Um, basically, when an inspector goes to a facility, they look at lots of different things of what's going on with the process. So we look at, for instance, paint usage records. We look at the amount of gallons they used and in which in each part of the processes. We look at the VOC contents of those coatings and we verify and check the math in terms of what kind of emissions are coming off the usage of those materials. In addition to that, we would also look at, for instance, thermal oxidizer records and make sure the units are up to temperature. We could look at the past testing uh, values that have been done to those and make sure that they're taking the proper control credit for the operation of the control devices. Um, other units, for instance, with particulate emissions, we would likely have emission factors either developed from testing or from vendor guarantees. Um, and we would also look at natural gas usage records as well. Those so, are a few examples of information that we would look for. And it takes quite a while to do an inspection of a facility this size, for sure. And so I was wondering if you could just, just as this, like another follow-up question to this and part of the process um, is how often would we be expected to inspect a facility like this? I know when we had talked last week, um, Jeff had talked about how, you know, what are what we're required to do by EPA's mandate, but then what we actually do is typically a lot more than that, especially as a facility kind of gets up and going. So could you talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. Um, from our EPA mandate, we're required to go out there a minimum of once every two years. With the startup of a facility, we will be out there a lot more, especially at the beginning of the process. We will be out there to observe testing and make sure um, things are operating as proper, such as we'll view the destruction efficiency test of the thermal oxidizers, or we will look to verify the capture efficiencies of the spray boost and the destruction efficiencies of the oxidizers again. Um, we also respond to any complaints that come in on the facility. We'll conduct investigations as if there's odors that arise from the facility. And um, anything uh, other people would call in for concern, we would uh, have caused a reason to go out and conduct a site inspection. Okay, thank you. So seeing no other questions, and I think you guys can tell I'm kind of dilly-dallying a little bit here because I just want to make sure that nobody else has any. We're getting close to seven though, so uh, I'm going to just kind of take a step forward here a little bit more, one more step, and talk to you all a little bit, remind you again how to raise your hand if you want to make a verbal comment on the record.
So remember, and I know you've heard me say this before, and I apologize for repeating myself, uh, but if the green arrow is there, it means your hand is down. If the red arrow is there, it means you, your hand is already up. So if you want to raise your hand for this portion and, and make that official comment, you can feel free to do that. So seeing no other questions, I think we're going to go ahead and start the hearing portion of the night. So I just want to remind you that during this portion of the meeting, we won't be responding to any of your comments. So these comments that you'd be making now are for the official record and all your comments again will be reviewed. You'll hear me say that again in, in a couple of minutes when I have to read the official statement. Um, but just so you know, you won't be getting any verbal feedback from anybody on the panel. So. Um, and as a reminder, I'll tell you how you can get a hold of them if you have other questions after this is all over. So I'm going to go ahead and I have to read a, an official statement to open up the hearing. It's a little bit lengthy, so I apologize in advance, but I want to make sure that everyone kind of has the rules of what the hearing is all about and are ready to go. So start thinking about whether or not you want to make a comment and I'll go ahead and get started with the hearing. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this public hearing. My name is Jennifer Dixon, and I am with the Environmental Support Division of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE. I will be the hearings officer tonight. We also have Mary Ann Dolahanty, Air Quality Division Director, listening in on this hearing, who is the decision maker for this permit application. This hearing is for the proposed permit to install for the installation and operation of a new automotive assembly line consisting of a body shop, a paint shop and a general assembly area at the General Motors Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant to be referred to as GM going forward. This facility is proposed to be located along the border of Detroit and Hamtramck. The Air Quality Division is responsible for regulating sources of air pollutants to minimize adverse impact on public health and the environment. The law governing those responsibilities is Part 55 of the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act. Before GM can install the proposed automotive assembly line, they must obtain a permit that meets the requirements of Michigan's air quality rules and regulations. This means GM must be capable of meeting state and federal emission standards, including health-based standards. The proposed permit must also contain conditions, including emission limits and specific ways of operating the equipment to ensure these standards are met. The purpose of tonight's hearing is to give anyone interested in the proposed assembly line at GM an opportunity to provide information the department may use in deciding whether to approve the permit to install or if there are any items to consider. Please note the proposed permit to install is still a draft permit. This does not mean the department has already made a decision. Instead, it reflects an initial technical review of the proposed project. We hope having the details of the draft permit available will help you in providing these comments. Everything in the draft permit remains open for comment and further consideration by the department, including whether the permit will be granted at all. Please recognize the department can only use the information you provide if it relates to the criteria the department must use in making a decision. For example, concerns related to local zoning, truck traffic, and noise are not within the department's authority. Some of you may want to simply express your support or opposition to the proposed project. We will be happy to make note of your position, but please understand the department is by law not allowed to base our decision on whether there is widespread support or opposition to the proposed assembly line. This hearing is being recorded and your comments will be part of the information the department will consider in making its decision on the proposed automotive assembly line. The public comment period for the proposed permit began on March 25th, 2020 and will end at midnight on May 29, 2020. Additional comments may be submitted via written or verbal comment during this hearing and by mail, email, or by voicemail after the hearing ends all the way to the end of the comment period on May 29. After the close of the public comment period, the decision maker will review all written and verbal comments received. All significant air quality related comments will be considered, at which point a final decision will be made by the decision maker. The decision maker may deny the permit approve as drafted or approve with amendments. If approved, the decision must specify the provisions of the draft permit, if any, have been changed in the final permit and the reasons for the change. In all three scenarios, all interested parties, including everyone who was on the original mailing list, anyone who provided comments during the public comment period, anyone who attended the April 28th informational session, 
and anyone attending tonight's public hearing will be directly notified of the decision. Included in the mailing will be a letter from the decision maker regarding the decision and, if applicable, the approved permit. As stated previously, if you submit a written comment at any time to the email address provided or via postmail, um, it will be considered. You may also type the word comment into the question box and submit your comment there. I will read all comments aloud that you've submitted unless you state do not read. If you would like to make a verbal comment, you may raise your hand and I will unmute your line so you can speak. We will limit your comment time to three minutes. If you are speaking, I will let you know when you have about 30 seconds left. I will do my best to address commenters in the order your hands were raised, but please bear with us as the technology has challenges with doing that. Please recognize department staff are here tonight to provide a fair opportunity for you to express your views on the proposed automotive assembly line and to listen to those comments. Thank you for your attention. I will now begin calling the names of those who have indicated they would like to make a statement. I'll give you guys a few minutes to either type your comment or to raise your hand. I don't see anyone right now, but I want to make sure people have ample opportunity to provide comment if they would like to do so. Okay, I have someone who has raised their hand. So, um, Ms. Buttry, I'm going to unmute you and you'll be able to make your comment. You should be able to speak now. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Reverend Sharon Buttry and I live in Hamtramck at 2300 Nabel Street, about a mile from the plant. I'm a senior citizen. I live with my husband who has asthma and is a cancer patient. The air quality in our community is a vital concern to us for good health and for the health of the families in our neighborhood. I would like to register my concern and dismay that this online public hearing has not been translated tonight in the most common non-English languages spoken in the community nearest the GM Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant, namely Bengali and Arabic. Also, the public information session last week was scheduled on the first day of Ramadan and the hearing today during uh, the first week of Ramadan. This would compare to holding the information session on Christmas Eve and the hearing during the Christmas holidays. With respect to language and culture, just about any other time would be better to get information and comments from the community most impacted by the permit that is now under consideration. So I would suggest extending the, com the comment time at least to June 30th to allow for greater community participation. GM is our neighbor to the south and our community depends on the tax revenue and the jobs provided by General Motors. We expect and depend on GM to comply with laws that will protect our health and the health of their employees. So my particular comment concerns item four on page 36 of the proposed permit and every other section of the permit that requires testing, quote, once every five years, unquote. It seems to me there are many variables in the vehicle production process that could create failure of the process and in turn health hazards. I propose adding at least annual testing to promote greater transparency and protection of the health of employees and the community. Testing for hazardous air pollutants every five years is just not sufficient. This long period of time in, in between testing will not allow GM or the state to catch excess emissions or problems in the system leading to excess emissions. As a result, excess emission events could go on for years at the expense of residents' health. We deserve to know what's in the air we breathe and we have the right to breathe clean air. I submit my comment respectfully and I look forward to speaking with you in the future. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your comment, Ms. Buttry. If you'd like to go ahead and mute yourself again, that would be wonderful, or I can try to do it here. I think I did it. I haven't done that part before, so I apologize. All right, I don't see anyone else with their hand raised right now, and I don't have any other comments in the comment box. But again, I want to give you ample time to be able to submit your comment tonight. So I'm going to just hang out for a little bit here and um, feel free to enter that in. Okay, seeing no other comments or hands raised, I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing for tonight. That involves reading a closing statement for the record. Thank you for taking the time to participate in this meeting tonight. We appreciate your interest in protecting Michigan's air quality. As indicated at the beginning of the hearing, the public comment period will close at midnight on May 29, 2020. As a reminder, all interested parties, anyone who attended the April 28 informational session, Anyone who provided comments during the public comment period and anyone who attended this public hearing will be directly notified of the final decision on this proposed permit. The hearing is now closed. Thank you again. So now that the hearing is closed, there's a couple other reminders that I wanna make sure I put out there for anyone who is still interested and still on the line. So I know not potentially not everyone who's listening either on the phone or via the web had an opportunity to give a comment tonight. So I wanna make sure that we provide you with the information you may need to be able to do that. So if you're just listening in, or maybe you're even new to what this project, proposed project is all about, there is a lot of other information out there. You can either get a more cursory review of the proposed project, or you can dig really deeply down into the proposed project. So um, if you go to our website, this is where everything is. And if you can't find it, or you're feeling like, I went to your website, Jennifer, and I don't know how to find anything. So please feel free to just reach out to one of us, reach out to Dave, reach out to myself, and I will point you right to what you're looking for. So on that web page, you can find the proposed project summary, which is kind of a high level review of the proposed project. The technical fact sheet goes into some of those things we asked questions and answered questions about tonight. Like what is that review that's done prior to the permit um, being written, the proposed permit being written? You know, what goes into that? It talks about a lot of the rules and regulations. So it is pretty technical, but it's also interesting and gives you a lot of that background information. You can see those proposed per permit terms and conditions that Sharon mentioned when she gave her comment. So if you're interested in reading what the proposed permit looks like right now, um, and if you would like to comment on certain aspects of that permit, we would definitely welcome that. There's links to um, other information. You'll be able to access the recording to the virtual public hearing that we just had and other information is out there as well. So again, if you want to contact any of us and you're online right now, um, you can definitely see all of the different people that were on the panel tonight. So just as a reminder, Dave Thompson was our permit engineer and I'm gonna just reiterate his email address and phone number again. He has agreed to be the point person for any questions that you may have, and he will get you to the person who can answer those questions if you're just calling in and you can't see what's on the screen. So again, Dave Thompson's email address is thompsond22 at michigan.gov. So that's T is in Tom, H is in help, O is in octopus, M is in Mary, P is in Paul, S is in Sam, O is in Octopus, N is in Nancy, D is in Dave, the number 22 at Michigan, all spelled out, dot gov is in government. And his direct line is 517-284-6787. And then if you have questions about how the inspection process works or, or what 
an inspector would specifically do with a proposed permit like this in a new assembly plant, please feel free to reach out to Jeff Korniski or Bob Burns. Either one of them is um, great and will get you the answers you need. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in finding out more about air monitoring in the area, so what are, what are we kind of measuring um, on a daily, monthly, weekly basis? What does that look like? Feel free to reach out to Susan Kilmer. If you're interested in the air modeling that Jim Haywood talked about, um, he's a great person and he has a fun accent, so he's a good person to talk to as well. Um, and then we didn't get to hear from Mike Deppa tonight, um, but he did our toxics analysis for this proposed permit and he's also happy to answer any questions that people may have going forward. So again, we wanna thank you so much for participating tonight and taking time out of your schedule. We understand that things are challenging for everyone right now. And so it's even more important that we work with community on getting the information to you and from you that we are all looking for. So um, we are going to be closed captioning the recording of today's conversation. We will let everyone who's been on know about that. So the, the way the closed captioning works, just to mention this, and I, I think what I wanna do is make sure that I um, put this out there when we put our note out is if you, once we close caption it, if you are um, can read in a different language like Arabic and Bengali that Sharon mentioned, um, the YouTube will, and it's not perfect, but it will translate that for you. So it's just another option to try to help get information out to some of our community members who maybe don't read or speak English as a first language. So again, I know that's not perfect, but hopefully it's a little bit helpful. And um, if people have ideas on other things they would like to see translated, we did translate some documents into those um, two languages, but if there's other things that people would like to see translated or other ways we can better communicate with certain members of the community, we're always open to that kind of information as well. So again, greatly appreciate your time tonight, and I hope you all have a great uh, rest of your evening.